Welcome to Practice Update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizullah. Joining me today is Dr. Wolfgang Wick, the principal investigator of the EORTC trial, the phase three trial, with results that just came out here at the Neuro-Oncology Conference 20th Annual Meeting. Dr. Wick, let's talk about these trial results. A little bit. Give us a little bit first of the overview of the study design and some of the results, synopsis of those results. Yeah, I think um, bevacizumab has been used for quite a while in recurrent disease. And we felt that we didn't have a trial that really compared it to what is called the standard of care. Yes. We had a phase two trial coming out last year, which had three arms and suggested that the combination of bevacizumab and lomastin might be superior to both bevacizumab and lomastin. And yes. since um, lomastin would be considered a standard of care in Europe, we did a trial comparing lomastin versus lomastin plus bevacizumab. Um, the trial accrued only patients with first recurrences of a glioblastoma yes. weeks we paid particularly attention that the patients were out of the regular radiochemotherapy at least for three months to avoid any confusion with um, Zulu progression. Mm -hmm. So we, we um, um, accrued those patients, then randomized two to one between bevacizumab plus lomastin versus lomastin and um, had um, a very nice progression-free survival difference. So um, 4.6 months versus 1.6 months. Yes. So hazard ratio of uh, around um, 0 0.49 for, yes. for progression-free survival. Sure. We had an interesting, at least, neurological deterioration-free survival, which was already not really different between the two arms. Yes. And the overall survival, which was the principal, uh, the primary endpoint, um, did not show a difference. So the hazard ratio was 0.95. Medians are pretty similar, so no real signal that bevacizumab plus lomastin is really um, enhancing over survival. Right. So the BLOB trial that uh, preceded this particular yeah. trial showed some benefit. So this was a much-anticipated trial, and the results today are going to change clinical practice, of course, here in the U.S., but in other countries as well. Can you give us a distinction of changing practice, you know, standards of care that would happen here in this country as well as, you know, elsewhere? I think we have a separation, really, as you pointed it out, between the countries where bevacizumab has been approved already for yes. use in recurrent treatment. I think for these countries, it will become a little difficult because we have um, a situation where um, the, the post-approval uh, commitment was on a trial for overall survival. Yes. This is one problem, but I, I could see it also that um, the totality of data that we have until now. So looking at the Avaglio data, the RTOG data, the OTC trial data, all other trials data could at least indicate that there's clinical benefits. Sure. So probably away from just looking at overall survival, there's some clinical benefit. Progression-free survival is meaningful to patients, of especially course. to patients with a neurological deficit. This would mean that they are probably doing better than with another treatment modality. So. Um, it may change the use to a later stage sure. in the disease. It may also, from the regulatory perspective, be at least a challenge how to deal with that. Sure. I would say in the countries outside the US, the use already has been pretty much restricted to um, the palliative um, situation, so a later stage in the disease. So we have not really done a regular first um, recurrent use of bevacizumab. And therefore, I would say that for us, it's probably not really changing a lot. Okay. So access, of course, might be more difficult because payers may be a little bit more restrictive. They may yes. use it as an argument. What are you doing? Are you really sure you want to treat that patient? And um, this, yeah, this is about what, what, what I would think um, is the result. Excellent. Well, you know, the bevacizumab drug itself, of course, has shown benefit in the BILAB mm -hmm. trial. The overall survival itself that was seen there, the increase in overall survival, was that also seen with... Um, any impairment of quality of life, any quality of life indicators that, you know, The bill of trial was a, was a three-armed um, phase two trial with 50 patients in each arm. And I think it is pretty wise to say that those kind of trials do not really particularly look into quality of life. Yes. So what we have, of course, is some ste uh, steroid sparing effect in that trial. We have some also prolongation of progression-free survival. I would say that patients are not deteriorating in our clinical practice. I know that the RTOG has some conflicting data in the yes. primary situation. I think we've not seen that so far in recurrent disease, mm -hmm. but formally it has not really been evaluated. Okay. So now we're looking towards the future and probably changing our lens and our focus a little bit more. So what other studies that might be coming up mm. you know, in the future that you'd love to be participating in and possible mm. study design elements that you'd like to see present? So I think it's really... Um, much much in neuro-oncology will be in the future about 
really selecting the proper patients for, for, for use. And proper patients may be according to molecular markers in the tumor, yes. maybe due to heterogeneity in the tumor, maybe due to specific imaging features of the tumor, but may also be to some clinical characteristics. So to give you an example, um, there may be different trials for very young patients sure. and for elderly, elderly, older, frail patients. So I think we need to separate those um, um, categories. There may Absolutely. be different trials for patients with a specific molecular subtype. Sure. I think we need to pay more attention on that. There may be different um, aspects on um, the tumor growth rate, whatever. So, so we have that aspect. Second, I think, yes, I, I like all these um, molecular defined approaches because sure. I think at the end, this is something which is more reasonable than um, just to find something in that very difficult disease which fits all needs. Yes, sure. So we have that. I would think that um, the most promising approach in that respect is looking at newly diagnosed patients, not looking at recurrent patients, because sure. the tumors that we are looking at is changing over time with therapy. Mm. The pressure of therapy is Absolutely. changing the tumor. So newly diagnosed patients, um, targeted therapies, looking really into effects of that at the therapy is one aspect. Everyone is talking about immunotherapy. Of course. So, yes, of course, we are as well. Yes. <laughs> my, 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 my problem with that as of now is that we are doing very small steps. So we are now treating all these checkpoint inhibitors as if they were um, 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 chemotherapeutic drugs. So sure. we're combining them with the regular treatment and then we hope for some miracle success. <laughs> I'm not right. sure, sure that this is um, going to be the case. So I would love to see them really combined with something which is creating a more um, active immune microenvironment, which is creating more a mutator phenotype, which is creating some um, neoantigens to be, to be um, 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 shed by the tumor. So I think we need to be a little bit more um, active and creative in that way. Absolutely. And this goes towards more personalized, precise medicine, sure. really. So that sure. is the wave of the future. So I'd like to, to thank you for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to uh, more to come from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, yeah, absolutely. For practice update, I'm Dr. Fazana Hafazula. I have with me today Dr. Wolfgang Wick. Thank you, Dr. Wick. Thank you. For more advances in neuro oncology, visit the Brain Cancer Center of Excellence at practiceupdate.com.